<clears throat> All right, well, this morning we're going to uh, bite off a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a large chunk, uh, chapter 11. And I think you'll notice that uh, the first, uh, what is it, the first 18 verses of this chapter are simply a rehearsal of what we saw last time. So we've already gone through that. We're not going to go through that necessarily again. But there is a reason why this was raised again. And that's what we're going to look at. And that is as Peter defends what he did in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Then we're going to see the planting of the church in Antioch and then the response of that church to the Jews, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, in Judea, uh, because of the famine that was coming. Okay, so let me go ahead and read this, and uh, we'll look at each of these sections. Now, the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. <clears throat> and when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times and everything was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment there, uh, three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house, and he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in the house and saying, send to Joppa, and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here, and he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. How he used to say, John, baptize with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord." The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would, be certainly, uh, that there, that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this, this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this portion of his word to our hearing this morning. Well, last time, <clears throat> as, I, as I wanted to, to, well, as I reminded you, we want to look at what we saw last time and not forget. Last time we saw an example of how the Lord works to bring people to himself. 
How the Lord, remember, he prepared Cornelius to receive the gospel. Cornelius uh, was basically given the grace of God to be able to fear the Lord, to believe in the God of Israel, to worship him. That's not something Cornelius decided to do on his own. That's something that God gave him the grace to do. Secondly, by giving Cornelius the grace to seek after him. Uh, he was likely already converted, remember? We saw that he was likely an Old Testament saint like Simeon, like, like Anna the prophetess. Um, when the angel came to him, he was already disposed to believe. The Spirit had already given him a new heart so that he was inclined toward the gospel and he wanted to hear it. And finally, of course, by sending the angel to direct him to Peter so that he could hear that message. Now, we know that God doesn't work like this today. He doesn't, you know, at least as far as I know, send angels to uh, direct people. But we do know that God is at work. He is at work preparing people to receive the gospel. Uh, that's part of the process. It's not always just an instantaneous thing where a person goes from being a hater of God to a lover of God, though that does happen in a moment of time when the Spirit of God actually regenerates that person and makes them alive. The Lord usually makes several steps in the person's life first to bring them to Christ. But, you know, the Lord not only prepares the one who is going to uh, be ministered to, the one He's intending to save, He also prepares the messenger. And we see how He prepared Peter to bring the message to Cornelius, giving him this vision of the unclean animals, giving him the grace to figure out what all this meant when the messengers finally arrived so that he would be willing to go with them, and by giving Peter, of course, the power to preach the gospel, to be willing to share that message with the Gentiles. You know, the Lord is also at work preparing the messengers to bring that message to other people. And whenever you've had the opportunity to share the gospel with other people, I think you uh, understand the Lord does certain things in your life almost you know, right just beforehand to make you ready for that opportunity, something really we need to be praying that the Lord would help us to do. And then finally, we saw how the Lord gave the Gentiles His Spirit, how He descended on Cornelius and his household as at Pentecost, how they were speaking in tongues, how this was the evidence that God had received the Gentiles into His church, and so how Peter commanded them to be baptized which is, again, the sign of the New Covenant Church. Those who are included in the church need to receive that, that mark of the covenant. So giving it to these Gentiles meant we see them as being included by God into His household, into His family. That is a very big step, as we're going to see for the Jews this morning. Now, we see that this was just the beginning, of course. Now the Lord is preparing His church, the Jewish believers, not only to accept the fact that Gentiles can be included into the kingdom of heaven, but also to begin to reach out to the nations. That is, the Jews would now take the gospel to the Gentiles. This morning, I want us to think about three things from our passage. Again, the acceptance of the Gentiles by the Jewish believers, what it really took for them to do this. Uh, the first Gentile church established in Antioch, and then the Gentiles showing their love for Jewish saints in Judea. And again, each of these have lessons <clears throat> for us. Now, first we see the Gentiles accepted by the Jewish believers. Luke tells us the apostles and the brethren throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received God's word. And we might think that this would have been a cause of rejoicing, perhaps in giving thanks and praise to God, especially since they, these Jewish believers, these same Jewish believers, had already seen the Samaritans come to Christ. But instead, we see there was concern on their part. When Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised confronted him, specifically over the fact that he, in verse 3, went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. I don't know if you know this, but uh, the Samaritans at least were circumcised. But Gentiles were not. God-fearers were not. And that was, yeah, that was a big stumbling block to the Jews. Now, one big question that we have to face here is who are these people of the circumcision? Who are these circumcised people? There's really two ways that we can understand this. First of all, that they were the apostles and the brethren. They were the believers, the circumcised believers in Jerusalem. 
We only have to step back. Actually, we only have to step back a chapter. We just have to read what we read earlier on to see the struggle that Peter had in this very area. Uh, what the Lord had to do to prepare him to be willing to go and to preach to the Gentiles. That was a huge step. Now, the rest of these Jews were probably having the same difficulty. You know, that reminds us that change is difficult, isn't it? The Lord had been dealing exclusively with the Jews for nearly 2,000 years since the time He called Abraham and made His covenant with him. But now we're at this crucial point in redemptive history where he's turning to the Gentiles and he's going to begin to include them. Now, this was something he said he would do in the Old Testament, but again, remember, they never thought it would happen like this, that the Gentiles could basically pass, go as it were, or skip, you know, get out of jail or whatever, you, however you want to conceive of it, that they wouldn't first have to become joined to God's people in the Old Covenant as Jews before they could receive Jesus. They could become directly or they could come directly into the kingdom simply by trusting in Christ. Now, I think, again, I think we can relate to some of the things they were going through. I mean, have you ever made uh, theological changes in your life, changes of direction? You believed one thing, but then you started to believe another. I mean, I remember the difficulties that I had to work through. I was raised basically as an Arminian in an Arminian church, and then I was exposed to the sovereignty of God and salvation. And what was I supposed to think about that as R.C. Sproul is teaching chosen by God? Or going to a dispensational college and being a dispensationalist and believing these dispensational ideas and then beginning to see problems with that and being confronted with what's called the covenantal view you know, of how God deals with His people. We've all gone through, I think, experiences like what they were going through when you think it was one way, but then the Lord shows you that it's actually another way. And you begin to get a little bit ruffled by that. You're a little bit uncomfortable. John Frame in one of our classes called this um, the process that, that he would call cognitive rest, that you're, you, you get this new idea. You try to wrap your mind around it. You try to understand it. You, try to, you see that it's biblical. You see that you have to accept it, but you don't feel comfortable about it. But then eventually you do become comfortable with it when enough evidence comes in. These Jewish believers were going through a struggle like that. They weren't quite sure what to think about this. Now, the second possibility was that these were Judaizers. Luke literally calls these the circumcision party. Now, the Judaizers would be even more adamant that Gentiles must become Jews. They had to be circumcised. They had to observe the law of Moses. Jesus wasn't enough. And remember, we're in Acts chapter 11. When does the Jerusalem council come when they actually deal with the Judaizers? That comes in Acts chapter 15, which means that this was still a live issue in the church. It shows us that they were still trying to figure out how things are supposed to work in the new covenant, coming out of the old covenant. And we really shouldn't be surprised because the church has been working on this issue now for 2,000 years, and she's still not settled on the, basically the differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What is it that continues from the Old Testament? What is it that doesn't continue? Well, I think there's, there's actually an answer for that question. It still requires a lot of work to work out. But I think the best rule of thumb is this, that whatever the Lord tells us in His Word, whatever He tells us to do, whatever He tells us to believe, that remains in force until He clearly sets it aside. We need to make sure we don't take the dispensational route, which at least was the case when I was in college, where the Old Testament is basically seen as an obsolete book. You can take your Bible and tear that portion off of it and just live by the New Testament. Now, I do believe there's enough in the New Testament for you to do that, but I don't think that you should do that because we need to remember the New Testament believers did not treat the Old Testament as an antiquated book as though it were obsolete, but they saw it as the Word of God, as the Scripture, because that's what it was. We need to listen to what the Old Testament tells us, but we do need to recognize there are changes, but we need to look to see what those changes are, and we need to observe those things. Okay, well, again, the early church was having difficulty 
with these things. They're, they're right at, at the crux of the issue, where the separation or where these changes are being made. And that's the hardest place to be when you're working through something as significant as this. Well, Peter, of course, when he heard the charge, he settled them down by telling them how the Lord had worked in, in his heart and in his life to change his mind about the situation. He described the vision the Lord gave to him, the appearance of the three men sent by Cornelius, the Spirit's command for him to go with them, the Spirit's basically uh, Cornelius giving his account of the vision of the angel, the Spirit's falling on them as he preached the gospel to them, and how the Lord's giving them the Spirit showed that he had received them. I want you to notice here that, that Peter is essentially giving to, to these who are confronting him an apologetic, a reasoned defense for his actions, right? Apologetics aren't just for proving that God exists. We're talking about how do we minister, how, how can we argue with the unbelieving world and prove to them that God exists and prove that the Bible is the Word of God. That's only one aspect. We are also to give a reasoned defense for all that God says in His Word. We need to be willing and ready and able to give a defense for Christ's deity against the Jehovah's Witnesses, for the fact that there is only one God as over against the Mormons. We need to be able to defend the Trinity against the oneness movement, justification by grace through faith alone against Rome, God's electing grace as over against the Armenian view that basically it's man's choice and not God's. For evangelical obedience against antinomianism. And here's a big one. Moral purity among God's people you know, as over against the prevailing immorality of professing Christians. You know, it's sad, but the church is not that much different than the world. The Lord wants us to be ready to give an apologetic, to give a defense for all of His truth, just as He wanted Peter to defend this particular truth. And that's what Peter did, because that was what was true, that was what was right. Now, one other side issue I want us to notice here, and this would be an apologetic against the Church of Rome, okay? That notice that the believers who are present in Jerusalem, when Peter comes to Jerusalem, they call Peter into question, and they asked him why he did what he did. They said that he had to defend himself. He had to defend his actions. Now, think of that as over against what Rome believes regarding Peter, that he was the first pope. The first pope is the one who is infallible with regard to faith and practice. Whatever he teaches, what, basically what he does. They shouldn't have called him on the carpet at all. They shouldn't have questioned him. They should have said, you're the Pope, you're the boss, you're the vicar of Christ on earth, we'll just listen to what you said. But that's not what happened. Instead, we see that Peter was accountable to his brethren. And essentially, we're all accountable to one another, aren't we, for the things we do and the things that we believe. And that's the way that God keeps us going in the right direction. Well, Peter was in the right. He make his, made his defense. And when they heard what Peter had to say, they quieted down. No more objections, okay? They realized that God had received the Gentiles. And that, again, uh, was a, a great change and a great admission for them. But, you know, again, the issue is going to come back up in, in uh, Acts chapter 15. They're still working through the details, okay? But now that's the first point. The second point, we see the first Gentile church established in Antioch, which is later going to serve as a hub for reaching the entire world. Luke tells us that what happened, now well, really he tells us, he's, he, he started back in Acts 9, talks about those being scattered, he talked about what happened among some of them, and now he gets back to, to the rest of them, okay, who were scattered because of Saul's persecution. He said some went to Phoenicia. Phoenicia is along the coast, basically, in northern part of Palestine. It's uh, north of Mount Carmel, uh, the region where Tyre and Sidon are located. Uh, some of them went to Cyprus, which is that island off the coast of Palestine where Paul will go on his first missionary journey, and we're going to see that not too long from now. And some went to Antioch. Antioch uh, is, is north of Palestine. It's in Syria, Syria is basically the, the country that's north of Palestine. 
300 miles north of Jerusalem, and at this time the third most important Roman city, uh, third only to Rome itself and to Alexandria. Now, as these disciples traveled, Luke tells us that, that most of them preached only to the Jews. And again, I want you to notice the reluctance to minister to the Gentiles is still present. But Luke tells us that some of them from Cyprus and Cyrene came to Antioch and began preaching to the Greeks. Now, we've already noted where Cyprus is located. Cyrene was essentially a city in northern Libya, which is in, of course, northern Africa. Uh, the Jews that came from Cyrene were likely converted to Pentecost. But, you know, I want you to notice this. There are people coming, not only from Jerusalem, but people from other cities now are coming and going to various places sharing the gospel. And that's what we see in the early church. You know, they remember the Great Commission and what Jesus wanted them to do. And these aren't just the apostles. These are the disciples. These are the ones who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're doing what they can to get that message out. Well, notice the Lord blessed their ministry, particularly in Antioch. And a large number of Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. I want you to notice, too, what the secret of their success in evangelism actually was. Okay? Two things. The first one was they actually shared the gospel. Okay? That has to take place. But even if you do that, it's not necessarily going to be successful. Luke tells us what makes the difference is the Lord's blessing. He says in verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. This is what makes all the difference. If we want to see anybody come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to look to the Lord for his blessing. And again, let me just remind you <clears throat> what Sinclair Ferguson said in the lecture we heard last week. The churches that saw the revival and the awakening and saw the blessing within were those that were begging God to be present with them. Well, God was present with these men. And I think it was because they prayed, because they had a heart to serve Him, because they wanted to honor and give glory to Him. Okay? If we want to see these kinds of things happening, we must look to the Lord for His blessing. Now, when the Jerusalem church heard what the Lord had done in Antioch, they sent Barnabas. Remember Barnabas uh, the one whose name means son of encouragement, because he was full of the Spirit and faith. This is what makes us useful to the Lord, isn't it? Being filled with the Holy Spirit, having this strong faith, believing that what the Bible says is actually true. If we want to be useful to the Lord, that's what needs to be true of us. And again, let me just remind all of us, because we, we can so easily be taken away by the things of the world. There's so many things to do, not only for recreation, but all the cares and concerns of the world, the things that we put before the Lord. The only way we're going to have this kind of faith and this kind of spirit is if we put the kingdom of heaven first in our lives at all times. He is the priority. Everything else is secondary. God must be honored, He must be glorified, He must be obeyed, He must be served. His kingdom is the most important thing in the world. And that, again, is why the Lord has saved us. Now, when Barnabas arrived, he rejoiced to see what the Lord had done. That's interesting, isn't it? All this activity going on in Antioch, all these people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Barnabas sees them and he rejoices over what the Lord is doing even though it meant much more work for him. He was happy that the Lord was glorified. And again, this is what it means to put God's kingdom first, doesn't it? To find our joy and our happiness in seeing God honored in, well, in His church and just in the world. And being the son of encouragement that He was, He encouraged them to remain true to the Lord. And they were true to the Lord. And Luke tells us the result was many more were brought to Christ. Again, we need encouragement to follow the Lord. That's one of the things that basically preaching is about, is in, to encourage us to do this. Uh, and that's what he was doing. But we can encourage one another as well. And we should encourage one another and try to build one another up so that the Lord might use us to, again, bring others to worship Him. 
But we also notice that the work soon turned out to be too much even for Barnabas. Uh, that's a wonderful problem to have, of course, uh, by the way. And so as Farrell urged Calvin to come and help with the work in Geneva, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, to urge him to come and help. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, where they spent an entire year discipling these new converts, essentially teaching them how to frame their lives according to God's Word, how to worship Him, how to, how to serve Him. You know, there, there was a church we used to, Don and I used to be a part of, and they used to have this, uh, basically this slogan, this mantra, there's a lot of churches that, that have them. And theirs was, win, disciple, and send, okay? That's what we're all about. Evangelism, let's go get the gospel out to them. When they come into the church, let's disciple them, and then let's send them to do God's work. And they didn't necessarily have to leave the church or go to a foreign country, but basically get active in, in this process. Go out and tell others about the gospel, and we'll bring them in and disciple them, and then we'll send them as well. And basically that, that works pretty well. You know, did have a big turnover, sadly, because their discipleship was a bit lacking. But um, they always had a full church. You know, there were people that were coming in, hearing the gospel, and, and many of them were being saved. So anyway, that's what they were doing with these disciples. They were training them to, again, live as Christ would have them to live. And I want you to notice here what Luke also says about these particular Christians in Antioch. He says their lives were so transformed by the ministry of the Word that those on the outside began to call them Christians. I don't think, Luke doesn't say they began to call each other Christians, but they were called Christians, and the word means little Christs or followers of Christ, because those who were watching them saw Jesus in them. They were living like Jesus. And again, let me just simply say, that is the Lord's goal in saving us, is that we would become like Jesus, not merely to make us safe from judgment, but to transform us into the image of His Son. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, that when people look at us, Jesus is what they should see, even as those in Antioch saw this in the disciples. <clears throat> Now, again, it's not because their, their physical nature was changed, it's not because they changed the way they groomed themselves, not because they changed their attire, but it was because of the way they lived. And finally, we see an example of, of what it was that, you know, that shone from them that was like Jesus. We see their love shown for the Jewish saints in Judea. Now, Luke tells us that during this time, some of the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, this idea of coming down. You know, we think about Antioch as 300 miles north of Jerusalem, and yet it says here they came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. It's kind of a strange way of talking, but we understand that Jerusalem was built on a, on a hill, and whenever you leave Jerusalem, you go down, okay? So you go down to Samaria, you go down to here, so that's what's being referred to. And one of these prophets by the name of Agabus began to prophesy by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over the entire world. And not surprisingly, when we look back into history, we see that there was a great famine during that time, during the reign of Claudius. Remember what, I believe it was, wasn't it Ramsey, who said that Luke is one, the greatest historian who's ever lived. Nothing has ever been disproved of anything he has written. So anyway, at this time of this great famine, the Gentile believers in Antioch, as the Lord had given them the means in order to show their love and thankfulness for the gift that they had received of the gospel from the Lord's gracious dealing with the Jews, they put together a relief package for the Jewish saints in Judea and sent it by Barnabas and Saul. Now, <clears throat> what we have here is an example of a principle that is repeated many times in Scripture, and it's essentially this, that when one benefits spiritually from someone, that they are obligated to minister to that person or that entity uh, materially. Uh, Paul later explains the appropriateness of a similar gift sent to the believers in Jerusalem from the Gentile believers in Macedonia and Achaia. In Romans 15, verse 27, he writes this, Yes, they were pleased to do so, 
and they are indebted to them. That is, the Gentile believers are indebted to the believers in Jerusalem. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. And that's exactly what we see going on here. The Gentiles were so overjoyed for what they had received because of God's dealing with the Jews that they were willing to share what they had to try to relieve their suffering even though they were in this famine along with them. And by the way, this is again a principle and it's the reason why, one of the reasons why the Lord calls us to give to His church and to support the church that we're a part of because it's in the church that we receive from Him spiritually. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9.11, if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? And then he says to the Galatians, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. So essentially, again, this principle, when we are blessed, then we, we bless in return. And again, as we think about this going on in the lives of the believers in Antioch, you know, what is this but the outworking of God's grace in their lives and hearts. And of course, that's the kind of outworking we expect to see also in our own lives, right? If we have the Spirit of Christ as they have, then we will live like Him, which means that we're no longer going to live for ourselves and our own pleasure only. It's not that we can't, of course, recreate and do pleasurable things, but we don't live for these things. But rather, we'll live like Jesus, we will want to use everything that the Lord has given to us to support Him. You know, when we're talking about supporting His work, we're talking about giving to Jesus, aren't we? We give to support the work that He has given us to do in this world. And we won't give just our time. We won't give just our gifts. We won't sacrifice just our strength, but also the resources that He gives us in life. And again, let me just remind all of us, because we all need to be reminded what Jesus said to those who wanted to follow Him in His earthly ministry. He said we must be willing to give up everything in order to follow Him. And if we don't do that, if we don't relinquish our grip on it, and I'm not saying that we have to do what Jesus told the rich young ruler to do, you know, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. But what Jesus meant by this is if I tell you to sell everything, give it to the poor, you need to do that. Everything belongs to me. You need to see that you're a steward. It doesn't belong to you. You are to use these things for my glory, Jesus is saying. So that's what the commitment is that we make when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's a very difficult one to make. We can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. But if we have the Spirit, then we'll have this desire to do that even as these believers, these Gentile believers, these Greeks, by the way, we're Greeks, had in Antioch. So again, may the Lord encourage us through these examples. Again, through the book of Acts, we have many examples of what the early church was about. And those examples we have were certainly of outreach and seeking to honor Jesus by defending the gospel by preaching the gospel, by bearing witness of the gospel with our lives as well as our words, by using the things He's given to us to promote this work. And so may the Lord help us then as we think about this, and particularly in this last principle, that as we have received so many mercies from Him, I mean, we, we're the benefits of His Son's work. He became, He who was rich became poor for our sakes, so that we through His poverty might become rich, and we are rich through what Jesus has done. But now Jesus tells us, I want you to follow me in that example as we have received His mercy. May the Lord grant to us that we might also give what we have to Him for His glory and His honor. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to help us uh, take on what it is we've uh, seen in this text. Remember, we we prayed at the very beginning in this uh, hymn. I thought it was um, interesting. Let me see if I can pull up the words here. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. And then these words, take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. 
that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Well, the Lord has just sown some of his word in our hearts. We need to pray that he would help us to retain it and to basically bear fruit, to labor uh, for his glory. Well, let's bow in prayer.